Hi everyone, this is Ginger and you're watching Gnostic Psych, the channel where I share with you the arcane and interesting related to psychology. And if you like this video or any of my other videos, please click like and subscribe. And uh, my references, if you click on the downward arrow, we'll, we'll have them listed. Well, today I'm going to be talking about uh, sexuality researcher and LGBT uh, historian Jonathan Ned Katz's 1995 book, The Invention of Heterosexuality. And I have in my hands the 2007 version. Um, so the question you might have is, why talk about heterosexuality on a psychology channel? Well, because basically heterosexuality was actually invented by psychologists. I was actually um, surprised myself at how short of a history it was when I was first looking through the chapters in the book, and that's because the concepts really only existed since really the late 1800s. Um, prior to the late 1800s, heterosexuality was actually looked at as a sexual perversion. The reason for this was because prior to that time, um, sexuality was always looked at as a means to procreation. Therefore, in the psychiatric community, those who were found to have multiple par partners and to have sex without getting, without it leading to procreation, were considered sexual deviance. Well, starting around the late 1800s, um, not only did heterosexuality get a facelift, um, it was actually used to replace the old sexual norm, which was um, procreativity um, equals sexuality. Uh, during that time, there was sweeping changes in the social order with industrialization, um, the rise of women's rights, um, a consumer-based economy, and kind of the, uh, the, re the recession of religion's influence over society. Therefore, the psychiatric community uh, felt there needed to be a new order put in place in, you know, the vacuum. Um, so beginning with um, sexologists and psychiatrists like Richard Kraft von Ebing, who adopted the terms heterosexual and homosexual, and ending with uh, the legacy of Freud, we see heterosexuality emerging as a timeless norm and any other forms of sexuality as being abnormal. And therefore, they need to be treated as um, a medical condition and basically removed from the person. Um, Katz actually points out Freud's legacy um, in his influence by showing that Freud referred to hom homosexuality in all 24 volumes of his work 316 times versus the 29 references to heterosexuality. Um, one would argue um, that with such references that at that time, the concept of heterosexuality was still being kind of decided by the medical psychiatric community. And Freud felt in his mind that in order to really establish the norm of heterosexuality, he had to point out the abnormality of homosexuality. Um, thanks to Freud and the Freudians for most of the 20th century, gays and lesbians were look at, looked at as sexually fixated or at an immature stage of psychosexuality. And this gets into territory I don't really, really want to get into in this video because I don't want to get into the time uh, lengthening too much. But um, anybody who studied a little bit of psychology knows that Freud's sexual stages were all um, rooted in um, psychosexual development. Um, it really wasn't until uh, 1909 actually, that heterosexuality, heterosexual, anything related to that, first appeared in the Merriam-Webster New International Dictionary. Uh, prior to that, there was really no designation. Uh, heterosexuality's debut in a non-medical or dictionary-related piece of literature first made its appearance on September 7th, 1924, in the book review section of the New York Times. Interestingly enough, it was actually a review of Freud's book, Group Analysis, Group, I'm sorry, Group Sexuality and Analysis of the Ego. Um, it wasn't really until 
the middle of the 20th century, that actually we see that the work of Alfred Kinsey with his studies began to deconstruct um, the concept of heterosexuality, that he argued that it was more on a spectrum. And um, from the 50s through the 60s and 70s, we began to see in Katz's book that um, mostly feminists, um, like Betty Friedan with her feminine mystique, black feminists like Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks with intersectionalism, lesbian feminists like Ty Grace Atkinson, uh, Kate Millay, um, radical lesbian collective uh, with their woman identified woman, uh, Monique Wittig um, with the straight mind and AD, a, excuse me, Adrian Rich's compulsory heterosexual and lesbian existence. We, we see through all these works um, really kind of the identification that heterosexuality was a social construct and they do a really good job as um, described in that uh, Katz's book that um, heterosexuality has been a real slippery concept that's avoided um, critical um, inspection and through their work they've been able to really kind of put under a magnifying glass and point out that heterosexuality has really not only been a sexual orientation hierarchy, but one that compels women into sexuality and gender norms that benefit men sexually, socially, economically, politically, and autonomously. Um, and men are actually compelled to fit sexual and gender norms as a part of heteronormativity. Um, kind of going back to what I said, heterosexuality is then promoted as a timeless sexual order when it was actually timely and really only appeared at the beginning of modern industrial society. Um, and that uh, heteronormativity um, is a norm that's so pervaded by religious, news media, entertainment, cultural, educational, and political institutions that its existence is really taken for granted. Uh, toward the end of the book, Katz um, kind of gives us a little bit of, of hope through this deconstruction and through finally identifying um, the heterosexual forest for the trees that um, due to um, the popular um, lesbian and gay rights movements of the 70s and all of the work that's been done since then with sexual research that we're at the horizon of a new uh, sexual norm.